Hello everyone, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth, and I'm a board-certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. Today, I will be reviewing lichen planus as a part of my clinical review series. Just a reminder that this is not meant to be a comprehensive review of lichen planus. That will be coming soon, so be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss it. This is only meant to share the clinically relevant facts about lichen planus. But first, we have to get into the disclaimers, which are that the opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any organization that may employ me or that I may belong to, and that this video is intended for educational purposes only and should not serve as medical advice. Should you have any questions or concerns about your oral or systemic health, please see your nearest oral or systemic healthcare provider. With that being said, let's talk about lichen planus. Lichen planus is an immune-mediated condition. Simply put, it's too much inflammation where it shouldn't be. It's not exactly autoimmune because it acts differently, but let's just say it's along those lines and we don't really know exactly why it happens. It is chronic, so patients will have this condition for the remainder of their life. Lichen planus does tend to wax and wane, meaning sometimes it's better and sometimes it's worse. Lichen planus can involve multiple areas of the body, including the skin, genital, and anal mucosa. That's why I always ask my patient if they have itchy skin, especially in the areas of the flexor surfaces, like the wrist, elbow, knees, and ankles, itchy genital mucosa, or itchy anal mucosa. If they do, I always encourage them to rule out lichen planus in these sites as well with their dermatologist. In the oral cavity, some patients have lichen planus without any symptoms at all, and these patients don't usually require treatment. Many patients have symptoms with certain foods, like citrus fruits, vinaigrettes, and spicy foods. But some have ulcerations that are uncomfortable all of the time and can make it difficult to eat or speak. Unfortunately, there's no cure for lichen planus, but instead the goal is remission. Remission may sound scary because it's often used in the context of cancer, but in this case, it means the disease is quiet and not active. Lichen planus is one of the most common conditions that I treat in my practice. So, how do I treat it? Well, I have a few methods, or a few plans, if you will. Plan A is low-dose doxycycline hyclate, which is a pill that my patients take twice a day. You may be familiar with doxycycline as an antibiotic, but the dose that I prescribe it at is a submicrobial dose, meaning it doesn't kill bacteria. Instead, it inhibits something called matrix metalloproteinase, or MMP. MMP causes the tissue to break down. It can take up to three months to work, and it only works on its own in about 60% of patients. So because of this, I also prescribe a topical steroid gel for the patient to use either once, twice, or three times a day, depending on the severity of their disease. Patients are instructed to apply a thin layer of gel sparingly to areas involved by lichen planus with either a clean finger or a Q-tip. I usually recommend that patients apply the gel after they brush their teeth and then not eat or drink for at least 20 minutes to allow the gel to soak in. I prefer a gel to an ointment or a cream or a paste as gels are typically better tolerated by patients in the oral cavity due to being water-based rather than ointments, pastes, or creams which are oil-based. We know that oil and water don't mix. This gel is off-label and there's a package insert that states external use only and do not use for more than two weeks. One of the large pharmacy chains may even send the patient a video of a man in a white coat that says, don't put the gel in the mouth. As long as the patient is using this gel sparingly and not globbing it on, it's safe to use in the oral cavity. And many patients in my practice and in practices like mine use this gel in the mouth for a long time. The vast majority of patients have a good response to these two medications. Those that don't, we go to plan B, which is usually a medication called hydroxychloroquine. You may remember this medication from COVID times. This medication, which was initially used to fight malaria, was ineffective against COVID, but it is effective against many inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. These include rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and of course, lichen planus. The important thing with this medication is that patients must discuss taking this medication with an eye care professional to monitor their eyes, as there can be side effects involving the retina. 
They also need to let their primary care provider know to monitor for any changes in the blood. I have plans C, D, E, etc., which include other immunosuppressants like azothioprine, cyclosporin, and apremilast, but 60 to 70% of patients respond to plan A, and then another 15 to 20% to plan B, so we often don't have to resort to these other medications. Sometimes a patient will be in remission and have what is called a flare when the condition pops back up. Oftentimes going back on the gel will help make it go away again, but sometimes a steroid pill pack helps in case of a really bad flare. Now the controversial part. If you Google oral lichen planus, which I never recommend Googling without ensuring that you're reading from a reliable source, you may see lichen planus being called a precancerous condition. There is a lot of study and opinions about lichen planus and cancer. Most studies suggest that anywhere between 1 and 8% of patients diagnosed with lichen planus develop oral cancer. Even though this is a small percentage, I follow all of my patients, even the patients without symptoms that aren't being treated for life to monitor for any ominous changes. Some of the warning signs that lead me to encourage biopsy include lesions that don't go away after treatment, lesions that become pebbly or raised, or lesions that become more well-defined, like a leukoplakia, which I discussed in a different video. Other factors such as only being on one side or not responding to treatment might also encourage biopsy. Patients that have symptoms I usually see more frequently, and patients with no symptoms or who are in remission I follow every six to 12 months. So that's my approach to oral lichen planus. Other providers may have different approaches and opinions, and there are certainly other alternative evidence-based methods out there. And just because there are differences doesn't make one right or wrong. That's why it's important to discuss any questions or concerns with your care provider. Thanks for watching. Be sure to give this video a like if you found it helpful. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of my other clinical review videos. Thanks again for watching and be well.